scripture memory verse tonight. 2 Timothy 3, 1. But know this, in the last days, perilous times will come. 2 Timothy 3, 1. Anybody else? 2 Timothy 3, 1. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. 2 Timothy 3, 1. Good job. Anybody else? That's good. That's the that's the content. Perilous times shall come. Yeah. Now, before you say we had this, the last time we had this text, it was actually Second Timothy three sixteen and seventeen, and I backed up to three one, and we did the whole chapter. Now we're starting at the front of the chapter, and we're going to go through and do the whole chapter again. But it's a very important, I believe, text uh, that tells us what's going on, because God wants his sheep, his friends, to know what's going on. We don't have to guess, wonder, and worry. We might not know the exact times, but we can see the signs of the times, and we can hear his voice, and we can be faithful in what he's called us to do, and wait on the Lord to return. So anybody, anybody else want to try this? Um, 2 Timothy 3.1. 2 Timothy 3.1. But know this, in the last days perilous times will come. 2 Timothy 3.1. Good job. Anybody else? Context, 2 Timothy 3 1. Paul writing to Timothy. Paul being the spiritual father to Timothy. Timothy being uh, his spiritual son in the faith. Uh, I just want to, I'm going to back up just, just to read a couple things. And I could go all the way back to, you know, 1 1. But just go back up to 2 23. Right in the middle of something, but I just want to start there. Because what is going on in our culture is that we're being sucked into a physical battle uh, and arguing about physical things that have nothing to do with spiritual souls being saved. So we're being sucked into this, and then people get mad at you over the physical argument that you're in, and it does no earthly good for the spiritual soul. So he says here, and I'm just jumping into a point because I'm trying to make a point and move with a point, but avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing, and we should know, that they generate strife, right? That's all it does. It's a physical strife that doesn't open up a person's heart you don't learn whether the Spirit is working on their salvation because you're arguing about a physical thing that has nothing to do about the soul. It just has to do with what they see. It has to do with what they feel about the culture. Listen, and a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all. Listen, to all. Oh, no, I'm just being gentle to those people that are right around me. I'm just being gentle to those out in the streets, and I'm really mean to my family. No, no, gentle to all. Let your gentleness be known to all. The coming of the Lord is at hand. Is that a scripture we learned over in Thessalonians? able to teach and there's lots of different ways to teach but this is really in learning the scriptures teaching people through instruction patient 
one of the things that I'm being worked on about with the Lord. Patience. I don't want to be a doctor, so I keep running from it. Um, in humility, lowliness of mind, correcting those who are in opposition. And, and, and I would add that when we try to correct, sometimes, you know, we might just go, yeah, but the Bible says, try to learn people if you know them. And then learn how they learn. Watch how they react to correction. See, the Bible says he who hates correction is stupid or brutish. So we none of us like correction. So try to learn how to speak to people so that they'll receive the correction. So you uh, speak the truth in love is what Jesus said. Uh, because they're in opposition. And so they can be in the body of Christ and be in opposition to your understanding of the times. Opposition to your understanding of doctrine. They could be generally saved, but indoctrinated by some false teaching or belief system. And so God wants us to correct one another, counsel one another, and help one another uh, in the one another ministry. And it says here, though, they're in opposition. If God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth. Listen, what's repentance? It's a change of mind, metanoia. I mean, we're not down here to go, na 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 I know more than you. na 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 God saved me and he didn't save you. We're down here on purpose to be witnesses so that when they hear the truth, they will repent and come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. So we want to be wise as serpent and gentle as doves, and we want people to change their minds. That, I don't care. Just go to hell. If that's what you want to do, believe that. No, that's not, that's not what Jesus did. I mean, everything that he did when he spoke, even to the Pharisees, he spoke in a way that he knew that it would erupt. It would interrupt their mind and thinking, and they would sit down and think about that and want to change their mind or not. They'd either harden their heart or they want to change their mind. And, and many of them even got saved. We know that Nicodemus did. You know, we know that, that, that generally, uh, 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 historically speaking, that Pharisees got saved and the Sadducees didn't because the Sadducees were more after the culture, after money, and after power, but the Pharisees genuinely wanted to obey God. And they believed in resurrection. They believed in angels. They believed in the things that Jesus was talking about, but they were caught in a power struggle over the control of the nation. And then, of course, um, being led by Satan. So people can be in opposition, and that doesn't mean I'm through with you. I mean, we know Jesus said, pray for your enemies. Pray for those who spitefully use you. And see, what we're looking at in our streets today, and this is the, the theme I want to be uh, uh, kind of digging at as we go through this text, is that they're wanting us to fight in the street. They're wanting us to go out there like there's an enemy and go out there like we're supposed to be at odds. And they're, they're preaching civil war from their false prophet pulpits and, and the news. And we're supposed to pray for our enemies. We're supposed to be sharing with them still the truth of the gospel, not out there quarreling and arguing. And we're supposed to avoid that dispute and say, what are we really here for? That's the salvation of souls. So we want to be very careful not to get sucked into the vortex of what's going on on the planet in this graveyard and stay focused on what the Spirit would say to us and what He sent us to do and what He's called us out for. Why would He give us gifts and talents and abilities and teach us the Word of God to go out and argue with people? I'm not saying we don't contend for the faith because we do contend for the faith that was once handed to the saints, James tells us. Or Jude tells us that was once uh, and, and for all given to the saints. We are preaching the gospel uh, to people all the time. But God wants people to repent. He come to correct them. The word of God corrects them. Truth corrects us. And there are everybody on the planet that was ever born is in opposition to God. So we want God to grant them repentance that they may know the truth, because truth is a person, it's Jesus, and that they may come to their senses, not become delusional, 
but come to their senses like the prodigal son did. Remember the prodigal son? It says he come to his senses. He's out in the field. He's wasted everything with prodigal living, and he's, he's working for somebody in the fields, and he's feeding the pigs pods, and he begins to eat them because he has no sustenance. And then the Bible says he come to his senses. And we have to keep that as the forefront of everything we do in the gospel. That, I mean, as I look at the Bible, Jesus died. The disciples all died. They were all dying, trying to go to those that were in opposition and give them the truth and get them to come to their senses because it's not God's will that any would perish, but all would come to repentance. And I don't care whether it was then or now, our battle is not in the streets about government. It's not about physical things. It's a spiritual battle. It, 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 it's, it's, it's principalities and powers. It's a spiritual host of wickedness in the heavenly places. I mean, that's the battle. So it's a spiritual mindset. And the only way you can deal with a person's spirit is speak truth to them. And if you want to argue, boy, they love to argue about who's the best running back. If you want to argue, they'd love to, to argue about what's the best way to deal with a country's finances and the government and the best things to do in school. They'd love to argue with that. Everybody that's physical wants to argue about these things. Well, I know there's some people that just, they're not, they're not saved and, and they just, I don't want to get involved. I'm just going to go plant my flowers and, and they just hide and, and, and they don't do anything. But that's not what we're called to do either. We're called to be witnesses in the choices that we make free will. And the Holy Spirit uses those free will choices to be a testimony to the people around us. So, listen. God wants them to come to their senses. It's up to the Spirit and them. If God grants it, it's because they are choosing in their heart to come to salvation and to believe God. We don't know when a person believes God. Listen, we're going to see in a minute. You can recognize fruit. You can recognize a life that's changing. I, I believe that. Jesus said you can tell a tree by its fruit. Epigenoscos. You'll be able to recognize it by what they're doing, how they're living, what they're pursuing, where they put all of their energy and time and their argument at. You can tell that. But he says, they come to their senses, and what? They escape the snare of the devil. See, the devil's got them in bondage. The devil's got a rope wrapped around their leg. The devil's dragging them to their side, having been taken captive by him to do what? His will. And see, we wake up to do God's will. Jesus said, not my will, but thy will be done. No, not what the physical. The physical wants to get away from this. The physical doesn't want to drink this cup. The physical wants to hang out and be buds with people. But what about God's will? What about God's will? So we need to um, be careful not to get sucked into uh, ignorant disputes. We need to avoid them. Take them back to Jesus. And then he says, as if there's no chapter, verse, break, chapter 3, verse 1, as if there's nothing there, but know this. Listen, while you're doing that, know this. Gnoskos. Come to know this. Learn this. Understand this. That in the last days, perilous times will come. Now, I'm going to show you, and, and, I, and I think we can understand this, and remember that Paul, writing to Timothy, is writing to the church. He's speaking of the church and things that it takes for us to be sanctified and cleansed and do the will of the Lord. And so he's talking about people that's been taken captive, I believe, that are in the church. And they're moving in the wrong direction. They're doing the wrong thing. They're in opposition to what God's doing on the planet. They're either apostate or they've been taken captive and moving in the wrong direction instead of the way the Spirit is going. And that's the context we have. And he says, know this, in the last days, perilous times will come. Listen, we are in the last days. And technically, biblically, the last days are every day since 
Jesus ascended back into heaven. So all of the church age is really the last days uh, in many contexts. And, and as, you, as we go through this and we look at this, we're going to look at an ugly list, right? And, and I was reading it, looking at it, and I'm saying, listen, we are called to go and to grow. We are called to bear fruit worthy of repentance. We're supposed to be growing and being sanctified and washed and cleansed and looking more like love, like God. God is love. And, and, and love looks like joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such there is no law. And yet we're seeing now in this text written uh, a couple thousand years ago that's telling us in the days we're living in right now, the perilous times will come and the church will look like this list of Danes. The church, listen, the so-called church will look like this. Not, not the world. The world always, the world always looks this evil. <coughs> but I believe this list is the church. Listen to me. I believe it is the church and, and I'll tell you why. Avoid the argument. Avoid the, the, the things that are going on with the ignorant disputes. But notice when he gives this list, and I'm going to just jump you forward, that in 5b, he tells us, and from such people turn away. Because he's talking about the church. Don't have fellowship with such people that call themselves Christians and they live and have these characteristics of unholy fruit. And you're going to see it in a minute because it's very important to understand uh, because they suck you in. And now I'm part of what they're doing. But we're supposed to be going and growing and going to the world and witnessing. And he's saying, turn away from these people. He wouldn't say, turn away from the world, but go and make disciples. Turn away from the world, but go and be a witness. Turn away from it. He's saying that in the body of Christ, you turn away from people that call themselves brothers and sisters, and yet this is their fruit. This is the fruit. That's what he's saying. That's what, how I read the text. But let me continue. I just wanted to prep, uh, 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 preface it as we go through this. Know this, gnoskos. Have the knowledge understand it last days eschatos last days it's where we get the word eschatology study of end times study of last things eschatology it means the final or the farthest the uttermost days he says perilous times furious dangerous fierce times uh, and here's the, here's the thing I want you to see is that the word perilous has the idea of a reduction or reducing in strength. Actually, um, did I look that up? Yes, I did. Uh, 1828 Noah Webster's Dictionary, and I would suggest if you're going to use a dictionary for words, don't use modern-day dictionaries, just like you shouldn't use modern-day translations of the Bible. Most of them are not even good commentaries, of what the Bible should say, and they're not good versions. But uh, 1828 Noah Webster's Dictionary uh, uh, defines perilous as dangerous, hazardous, and full of risk. R-I-S-K, risk. So we know that it's furious, it's dangerous, it's fierce times, and that there's a reduction of strength in this season or this occasion, this time of the last Days, And we can see, if you think about the strength which comes from the Holy Spirit, the strength which comes from knowing truth, the strength and the power of God that the church is supposed to have, what does he say in Acts 1-8? But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you to be witnesses for me throughout Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. We should have strength. We should have power. We should know the word of God. And we should be able to know when to speak, when not to speak. When to avoid foolish disputes 
and when to contend for the faith. That's the wisdom the Holy Spirit would give us. You never seen Jesus caught up in any useless wrangling or prattling or speaking any words that did not matter. And he knew who to speak to and how to speak. So perilous times has the idea of reduce, reduction of strength or reducing the strength. And that's because when people ignore the, what the Spirit is saying to the church, when people ignore the Word of God in proper context, you're going to reduce the strength of the church. And that's how they become this entire list of ugly things, um, which we'll get into in a minute. But first I want you to see first usage of perilous and times both. Listen to me. It, they're both first usage in back-to-back -back verses. And I think it's important. It's over in Matthew 8, 28. Matthew 8, 28 is the first usage, uh, and it's the word exceedingly fierce. Exceedingly fierce. 8, 28. If you remember, it's when I don't like uh, the Jurgasines, uh, Gurgasines. It's really the Gadarenes. Because you're reminded with Gadarenes um, that it's the tribe of Gad. Remember the tribes that did not cross over where they were supposed to be? And so Gad was on the wrong side. They were, they were and so it's the Gadarenes. What was it? Uh, uh, I forget the tribes. Manasseh. What was the tribes that didn't cross over the Jordan? Reuben and Gad and Manasseh. Is it that the three tribes? <clears throat> anyway, um, here's the verse. Verse 28, 8, 28. When he had come to the other side, notice he's on the other side, to the country of the Gadarenes, there met him two demon-possessed men coming out of the tombs. They're living in the graveyard. They're living out in the world. We call this a graveyard exceedingly fierce that's the word perilous right there exceedingly fierce so that no one could pass that way and suddenly they cried out saying what do what have we to do with you Jesus you son of God they knew who he was have you come here to torment us before the time before the day last days that's that time is the First word for the days, and perilous is exceedingly fierce. Now notice, why am I telling you that? Because in the first usage of these words, you have demons that were exceedingly fierce. And in these last times, these last times, according to Matthew 24, are as the days of Noah, when the demonic activity was exceedingly fierce. It was more and more and more. And so therefore, we need to draw near to God and hear what the Spirit would say to the church all the more because there's demonic activity out there and they're coming to deceive the elect if it were possible. So you need to be awake during this time. It's going to be exceedingly fierce times. It's going to be times when you're going to say, I don't know who to follow. I don't know who to believe. I don't know who to listen to. It's going to be times when mother and father and sons and daughters will be against each other. I hope we get to those texts in a minute there's some of the first usages but what you need to know is you have a personal love relationship with God and you need to read the word of God and draw near to God and he will draw near to you and you need to hear what the spirit would say to the church you are the church the ecclesia the called out ones and it's up to you to listen and obey God and be a witness to others you can't ride on somebody else's coattail. We're working together in the one another ministry. So here's these, they're coming. They're here. They've been here. And if you can't see that they're getting exceedingly fierce and worse and worse every day. Listen, every day. But the mandate of the church never, ever changes. No matter what the times are. No matter what's going on, we're called 
to stay in the word of God. Because you see, he gives us the, the answer at the end of the chapter. All scripture is inspired by God and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God might be thoroughly equipped, ready for every good work. We always want to stay there in the God-breathed word, what he has said, what he's doing, what he's done, what he's going to do. Stay there. And this is why he tells this all to Timothy. He says, you haven't seen nothing yet. Perilous times are coming. Four, verse 2, men will be lovers of themselves. Self-love. Listen, psychology. Self-love becomes an entire doctrine. This was written 2,000 years ago. Psychology just isn't very old. But it's been in the church for about 50 years now. Listen, though. Listen, though. All of this lovers of, lovers of, is going to be from the word philos, where we get, uh, it, it means to be an associate with, or a friend with, or fond of. You know, you get this, uh, philia is, the, is Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. So we have this love for these things. When you see this word, it's the same one. You become fond to it. You're loving it. You're pursuing it. So the first one is lovers of self, atos, uh, philo atos, philo atos, fond of self, selfish lovers of own self. This is the only place it's used in the Bible, and it's intent on one's own interest. Listen, you can be a good Christian and be confused and only intent on your own interest. And that means your loving self. Over in Philippians 2, 4, he says, don't look out just for your own interest, but the interest of others. Every single decision you make affects the interest of others. Every single decision you make is going to affect the fruit you grow, the witness you give, and, and it's going to be a, a, to somebody else's interest that's watching you. And so we have to be very careful with it. I'm not saying walk on rice paper. That's not what we're talking about here. But we're talking about know that we are not alone here and that we're being deceived into only looking out for ourselves. Well, you, you know what? You just, you just got to go on and just look out for yourself and stop worrying about other people. And you just got to take care of your own stuff. And you just got to do your own thing. And you just got to make sure you're climbing the corporate ladder. And you just got to make sure you're doing this. And it all becomes because our, psych, our psychology has been sewn in and sociology and all these philosophies have been sewn into the world and the church lives just like the world. I mean, everything that's going on in the world is being sucked into the church. I mean, listen to some of the pulpits. Listen to some of the teaching. No, don't. I just, I, I digress. Don't listen to it. But when you listen to it, they're teaching psychology. They're teaching positive thinking. They're teaching everything about self. How to be your best self. How to have your best life now. Is, is, is even a book by Joel Osteen, who's from the pit of hell. And if he doesn't repent, he's in opposition to God. If he does not repent, he will go to hell. I don't say that casually when I call out names, but if you don't call out names and you don't speak to the lie that's in the room, then you're not loving the people in the room. And you have to do it. In this type of a room, we're believers. We're here to grow. We're here to go. We're here to, to learn how to walk this out and not be caught up and entangled with the affairs of this life that we might please him who called us to be a soldier. So self-love. Self-love is one of the biggest obstacles. Notice it's number one. Love of self. Because self is the problem. The only good self is a dead self. We don't need more self-esteem. We don't need more of self. The problem with sin is we think too much of ourselves. You can't humble yourself when you're in your pride of self. You, if you think you're okay, you're never going to repent. If you think self is good, you're never going to repent. And we love ourselves. 
We love ourselves. In fact, over in the marriage chapter, which all of it's about, uh, we have no problem loving ourselves. But we're supposed to love our wives as Christ loved the church. And he actually even says, all right, maybe we should just go there. Uh, because that scripture just popped up and I wasn't planning on going there. Um, Ephesians 5. It's an interesting text if you look at it that gives us this. In 29, he says, For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. See, we take care of self. And that's why he's commanding us to love our wives as Christ loved the church. And he tells us how Christ is loving us. He died for us. Anyway, I, it's not that great of a point. Other than the fact is, is that you can be loving yourself and not even notice it. If you're not dying to self. The Bible says if anyone wants to follow me, let him... Take up his cross daily and deny himself. Listen, you were supposed to be dead to self. Paul said, I die daily. Not lovers of self, recognizing that nothing good dwells in the flesh. And so, therefore, if you are not walking in the spirit, you will fulfill the lust of the flesh. And so, therefore, we always want to be saying, what next, Lord? And, and be in tune with what the Holy Spirit is doing. What are you doing, Lord? What do I need to learn from this, Lord? How do I react to this, Lord? Teach me to die, Lord. You know, not lovers of self. This is the problem. This is the reason perilous times will come for the church. I'm not talking about perilous times where they're burning down cities and rioting in the streets and there's wars and rumors of wars. That's going to happen. God already told us. The perilous times are in the pews. The perilous times are in the building stones that call themselves God's church, his bride that are supposed to be preparing themselves to, for the wedding supper of the Lamb, and they've walked away from every bit of the will of God, and they're living according to the flesh. Listen, I can tell you right now, over in other countries where persecution is at, over just being a Christian where people are dying, they're not worried about loving self. They're not worried about a lot of things we are over in this dead Christianity of America. And so persecution coming causes them to go out and share the gospel more. Over here, we want to fight in the streets about politics. Over here, we want to argue and dispute and throw some stuff up on Facebook and act like we're really defending the faith. You know, in other countries, they go out and die for the faith when opposition comes, when, when they're accused, when the things are going on. But over here, we just argue over the Facebook. We argue, and I don't even know what I'm talking about when I talk to, I, I haven't been on there. So <laughs> I say all the words wrong. Listen to me. Instead of when persecution comes, we speak the gospel louder. Persecution comes and we get sucked in and say why we shouldn't be going to persecution. That's the wrong argument. That's a physical argument. Everybody in the Bible died for their faith. They didn't go argue about it. They went out and continued sharing it. In fact, you're going to see here in a minute. Verse 11 in Lystra, where Timothy was from, Paul was stoned to death. And he didn't get up and go argue and go, we got to change some laws. This is ridiculous. All I was doing was walking down the street, and these guys over here drug me out and started throwing rocks at me. No, he got back up and went back in and started telling them about Jesus again in Lystra. And, and, and Lystra means ransoming. That's the very word it means, ransoming. And here's Paul who's willing to die for his faith, just like everybody else that became a bondservant. And when persecution comes, 
We don't shut up. We stand up. We speak up. And we and the Spirit wants to work even more. And not to argue about the laws of the land. Not to argue about the government. Not to get caught up in the politics and the affairs of this life. But to stay focused on the souls that are in opposition and are going to die if we don't keep the main thing the main thing. Because we're the only voice there is. Everybody else wants them to get sucked in. The false prophets, the false teachers, everything wants us all to get involved in not losing our power in our place. When in fact, your power is already gone if you're out there entangled and fighting about the affairs of this life because your power is in Christ and the gospel message, the anchor to our soul. Perilous times are upon us because men love themselves and they don't want to lift up Christ. Lovers of money. King James, covetous. Covetous. The love of money is the root of all evil. It's the word philagargos. Philagargos. I don't know how to say it. It means fond of silver. Fond of money. Listen, it's not a, it's not a mistake that silver stands for redemption. And then the Bible says that we're, we covet the silver. It's not a mistake that, that, that Judas sold his own soul for 30 pieces of silver when he could have had his soul saved by the very one he was selling out. It's not a mistake that these things all line up. It's the gospel truth that should give us more faith, more power, more strength, more reason not to shut up because people are being deceived by liars. So covetous. They love themselves and they covet silver. They love money. Top of the list, isn't it? After I love myself, I'm going to go make some money. And I don't care who I step on while I make it. Because that's what we're supposed to do in the world is make some little silver Dianas and worship them. Oh, did I say that? Little idols. Boasters. I mean, we're just going to walk through these a little bit. I, I, I would like to go a little bit deeper, but I probably won't. Uh, just look at the list of what the church is. Listen, the last days, this is what the church looks like. This is, this is uh, uh, heavy sometimes, but we want to make sure that we are looking like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Because this list is going to give us everything the opposite of it. Because we've walked away from God and His Word. Boasters are braggarts. It's actually the word vagrancy. Vagrancy. Which is interesting because the, again, Webster's 1828 says a vagrant is somebody wandering without a settled home. In other words, they haven't settled their mind and said, hey, I'm of the house of God. And, and they're kind of like in between two decisions, like Elijah and the Mount Carmel. You know, they, 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 they're a vagrant here, and, and, and they can't make up their mind if they want to live for God or they want to chase silver. So we don't want to be that type of a braggart. When we think of a braggart, think about it, that is somebody that loves himself, and they're bragging about what they're doing. And they really aren't doing it for the devil. They aren't doing it for God. So the only person they got to trust in is self. And they love self. And they're bragging about what self has done. And they're bragging about what they have done. But really, they got no place that they've settled as a home. And they're still in their own esteem. Their own self-love and self-esteem. This is pretty powerful stuff, really, when you look around. And especially if you watch people. And especially if you see the nature of things. And you see the spirit of Antichrist in the world. And you know what we're supposed to be doing. And you see how people are acting out in the work world and out of everywhere you go. How they're living. And, but for the grace of God, we'll all end up in a ditch. So, um, it means an empty pretender. This is what the braggart is, the boaster. You see somebody talking about I, I, I and me, me, me. That's a braggart. That's a boaster. It's an empty pretender that really doesn't even understand their identity and they're not settled yet. They talk a good game. But 
but as James said, I'll show you my faith by my works. You, you don't have to. I mean, if, if it's if it's done, oh boy, don't even go there. I'm not gonna go there. I'm not. Okay, well, I'm just gonna move on. Well, I, 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 again, maturity doesn't have to brag. I just heard a quote earlier where... I'm not going to go there. I won't. I'm torn, but I won't. Listen, as you mature in Christ, know where your strength comes from and know that it's not about you, so you don't have to have the tension. You don't have to, to brag about it. So they're proud is the next one pride God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble and, it, and it's this it's appearing above others that's what this word proud means you just appear like you're above others like like you're above them and see we're supposed to Jesus came down Jesus became and Paul said I become like them that I might win some of them I become all things to all men so you become like them. You meet them where they're at. Very difficult to do that because sometimes we don't want to get our knees dirty. We don't want to get our hands dirty. We don't want to get down in the street with the beggar and the blind and the cripple and the lame. But Jesus did. He touched the leper. But pride keeps us. It just It's haughty is the word. The next one is uh, blasphemers. Or blasphemous, blasphemers, scurrilous, scurrilous, scurrilous. Say it three times. Scurrilous. Especially impious against God. It means railing against God. Blaming God. Uh, speaking blasphemies. You know, and most people, you hear them, they, uh, uh, I don't believe in God, I hate him. Wait a minute, you don't believe, you're hating somebody you don't believe in? You know, and, and they speak blasphemies. I don't want to hear about God. I'm doing this and that. Yeah, yeah, and let's talk about the way that they made algae in the wilderness. And that's how they ate with that algae making machine that they got from aliens. Let's talk about that. Oh, really? That's where you're going to go with this? You, you really think that aliens bringing an algae making machine to the wilderness is how they ate in the wilderness? And you'd rather believe that than to believe there's a God? You hate him that much. You're mad at God that much. I'm sorry. You guys are like, where is he at? That was on the History Channel. And anybody watching the History Channel, you need to wake up and don't watch anything religious. You want to watch them redo a car? Be careful what they say. Because they're going to say, we've been working on this car for a million years. There's not been a million years. So every show is going to introduce lies to you if you're on TV anyway. But the History Channel, I've seen it one time. They... They, the, the theory is, is that aliens came down and taught the children of Israel how to make an algae-making machine, and that's what they ate in the wilderness. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. I mean, that takes a lot of faith to believe. That takes a lot of faith. I'd rather believe that God did it with rain and bread than to believe the other one. Who wants to eat algae? I'm sorry. I'm way off the line. Let's get back. But this is the scurrilous people that will say anything to keep you from believing in God. And their hate comes out. Their heart comes out. Their, everything about them comes out all of hell when they begin to blaspheme God. Listen, you say, what? Listen, you guys are thinking about worldly people. I'm talking about the church. This is in the church. People that don't have a worldview of creationism. People that are mad at God. People that go to church on Sunday and they act like they're okay with God, but they're really mad at God because they're not doing as good as the other person. And they blaspheme God in everything that they say and do. This, believe me, is the church. This is not the world. The world has always blasphemed God. Disobedient to parents. This is one of them, and there's about three of them here that's only used in two other or one other place, Romans chapter 1. 
Listen, it's not a surprise how you see children disobeying today. It's not a surprise. But, but the word disobedient means unpersuadable. Disobedient. Instead of obeying, they're not being persuaded to obey God. Not being persuaded to obey authority. They're unpersuadable. They will not listen to authority. They will not listen to parents. They will not listen to pastors. They will not listen to God. And everything about God is a God of authority. This is his planet. And they're unpersuadable. Unpersuadable to what? To repent. So you have to repent and change your mind, but they're not being persuaded to change their mind and believe in God or to believe in authority. So they're disobedient. To parents. And it's really weird when you look that up. They're the begetters. Parents is Greek for begetters. You know, begotten. Mm -hmm. They're begetters. I was like, oh boy. These words sometimes. Parents. Now let's go over and look at Matthew 10. 21. So they're unpersuaded to obey. Even in the church. Where's my Bible? It's in my lap. Got lost. I was trying to talk. Help. Where's my sword? Oh, it's in your lap. You ever do that? Look for my phone and I'm talking on it. Look for my glasses. They're on my head. I'm getting old. Suffering from OLD. What did I say? 1021? First usage of this word is in 1021. And listen to what it says. Well, he's talking about being delivered up, first of all, to uh, authorities, right? And he says, don't worry about it. You'll be given in that hour what you're supposed to speak. Uh, but the spirit of your father who, uh, who speaks in you, it's not you, the spirit of the father sends back the spirit. And then he says, 21, now brother will deliver up brother to death and father his child and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But he who endures to the end will be saved. Listen, endurance. You have need of hoopamony. There's going to be some affliction. There's going to be some danger. There's going to be some risk. There's going to be some perilous times. But we need to endure through it. And he's telling us that people are going to be traitors, even in our own family. And I always say, blood is thicker than water. Listen, blood, the blood of Jesus, the family that you're reborn into, is thicker than the water you was born from your mother. I'm not saying kick your family to the curb, but so many people will go fight and go do and go be, and, and no matter what, my family, my family comes first. Listen. Yes, as a man of God, a child of God, take care of your family. But at the end of the day, your family is the children of God. Jesus said about his own mom and brother who were outside. Who is my mother and my brother? But those who do the will of God. That's the family. Those who are persuadable. Those who will change their mind. Those who will die to self. Those who will humble themselves and be persuaded to believe God and follow God and, and be a child of God. That is your family. But if not, you can't be persuaded to that. Then ask the Holy Spirit. He'll teach you. I'm going to go back to the text. You need to be careful. Blood is thicker than water. Where was that word used? Is that where you're... Parents. Yeah. Oh. Parents is why I went there. Disobedient, unpersuadable. And, and he's talking about a time when they will and not, not just not be persuaded by their parents, but they'll turn them in. They'll, 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 they'll deliver them up to those same authorities because they're not... Who knows, wearing their mask? Who knows, not obeying government regulations? Who knows, they're, they're just not doing what they should be doing um, according to um, the culture. And some of the church has turned on other of the church. You know, much of the church that's apostate and walked away from God doesn't believe in God 
are doing everything from, from, from putting people in the pulpit that shouldn't be in the pulpit to ignoring the word of God and making up a cultural, I call it culturanity, a cultural gospel that makes everybody go love, 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 and let's tolerate and do whatever, which why, why would there be a gospel and a God and, and salvation or anything if you get to do what you want? If everybody gets to do what pleases them and what feels good and nothing's wrong because that's your truth, then why would there be any conversation or any church whatsoever? Why would there be any light if it was all darkness? Or why would there be any darkness if it's all light? Why would we be having the conversation if there wasn't a standard? I mean, and I always take it back to the basics. If you go to somebody's place of employment and you get a job and they go, here's the handbook, do this, and you go, nah, I don't think so. Guess what? Your paycheck ain't going to be very good. It's just that simple. It's just that simple. Well, now in the world today, we're going to see it in a minute. Good is evil and evil is good. And now you can go and show up and maybe not even show up and they'll mail you a check. And they're not allowed to fire you. Yeah, you're right. Not so much. That's because of how evil it has gotten in our world. Let's keep moving. I'm out of time and I've got 40 million other words to use. This list is pretty gnarly for it to be people who are supposed to be transformed into the image of God. What God are they being transformed into? What image are they of? It's certainly not the God of love. You can't love yourself and say, I love God. Unthankful. This is thankless or ungrateful in our entitlement culture. We're entitled, and if we don't get it, we're throwing a fit. Give me a coloring book. Listen, I don't mind giving somebody a coloring book, but I'm not giving you the crowns. You need to get them yourself. I'll help you to the table. But you need to learn how to color yourself. So unthankful. Think about that. Okay, let's go. It's Luke 6.35, first usage. We're going to be here for a minute. Luke 6.35. Dr. Luke, chapter 6, verse 35. I don't even know what it is. We're going to get there and see together. Oh, yeah. Well, this is interesting because... Is that the right text? Yes. After Mark. So 635, and I wanted to get you here because this is another good one. Where Jesus is saying, but love your enemies, do good and lend, hoping for nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the unthankful and the evil. This is the first usage of this word, unthankful. But God is still kind to them. Why? Because he wants them to come to repentance. He wants them to come to him, so he's still kind to the unthankful and the evil. Therefore, be merciful, just as your Father also is merciful. And that's another point of why we're not supposed to be drawing battle lines out in the street physically fighting, because God still shows his mercy and his grace and his love, and he still wants them to turn. And if we're out there in a physical fight with them, they're never going to see the spiritual truth and turn. And if they don't turn their hearts and change their mind, they're going to burn. It's just that simple. So I wanted you to see that unthankful even tells us about we should be good to them who are on the opposing side. Perhaps they will change their minds. Wow. Are we that far up still in this list? Unholy, which means wicked. Unholy just literally means wicked. What we were before we were born again. Now we have a position of salvation if we're bearing fruits worthy of repentance. Uh, because I think that's the reference. Unloving. Unloving is without natural affection. And the King James. It means unsociable. Think about that for a minute. 
50% of the church never came back. They don't want to associate with society anymore or the so-called church. They're unsociable. They want to stay in their house. They don't want to do anything. They're okay with the culture. And yet Jesus has told us to go. We're supposed to go out into the marketplace and share Jesus, not be unsociable. So unloving, there's no natural affection. We're inhuman is what their word is also. They're hard-hearted towards kindred. And, and really think about it. When you see parents killing their kids, when you see mothers that are not raising their children and they're letting other people raise their children, they have not natural affection. That when you become a parent, when you become a mother, when you become a dad, you die to self and you take care of your children and you raise them in the fear. That's what we're called to do. This is not to make anybody be shamed or feel guilty, but it's what we're supposed to be doing, especially in the church as we're being corrected. We're laying our lives down and showing them a picture of who God is by dying to what we want to do and putting our children first and not to give them every little trinket and teach them to be entitled and teach them to be ungrateful and unthankful, but to train them in the way that they're supposed to go. All of our energy should be in that as parents. First ministry, you cannot be a leader in the church unless you are in the house leading. You learn it in the house. You learn it in the marriage. You learn, and if you can't take care of your own home, you can't take care of God's home. That's first 101. And yet today, all you have to do is be able to be a good businessman, and they'll make you a leader in the church. All you have to do is tithe a lot, and they'll make you a leader in the church. All you have to do is know how to buy a $100 suit, and they'll make you a leader in the church. And I'm, 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 I'm more freaked out by it than I am being facetious about it. Because it should be about the Word of God and about the Spirit of God and about the things of God to be a leader in the church. And that doesn't mean we won't have disobedient children, but they should be in subjection to the house if they're in the house. Anybody that's in our house should be in subjection to the leadership, the godly leadership of the house. Where are you guys at? So the unloving, they're just, I mean, we're, 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 we believe in Jesus and we don't love. The very image we're being, the fruit, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, unforgiving. King James is truce breakers and truth, truceless. Uh, we don't forgive people. And God says, if you don't forgive, I'm not going to forgive you. But it says this, it's, it's, it's uh, without a treaty or a covenant. Isn't that interesting? Cannot be persuaded to enter into a covenant. That's what this word means. Truce breakers, unforgiving. Forgive one another. Slanderers. This is a really good one. To be the church. False accusers. That's what slanderers mean. It's the word diablos. Mm -hmm. Diablos. A traducer. Especially Satan or the devil. One who accuses falsely. Here's what it means. To depend upon the devil in thought and action. To be prompted and governed by him. Men who resemble the devil in mind and will. In the church. Because they slander and talk about others and falsely accuse them. That's really strange. First uses is in Matthew 4, 1. Jesus, after he's baptized, led away into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Diablos. Without self-control, or King James, incontinent. Powerless is what it means. No power. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but one of power and of love and of a sound mind. And the Holy Spirit is supposed to be leading us. We're supposed to be under the control of the Holy Spirit. Self-control. Not like an axe flying off the handle where I couldn't. You know, I was just swinging it, and that axe flew off the handle, and I couldn't stop it. And I was powerless to it. And I know I'm not supposed to go off. But you know what? When that happened, and I just, I just couldn't even. And then you're reliving the anger again. And instead of 
having self-control where God is, and you understand that this is about souls. You understand this is about the spirit. This is not about our pride and our self. And, the, and, and listen, listen, any one of these things, any one of us could do at any moment. But when we live this way, and this is our character, and this is our fruit, and this is what we do, and we don't care, that's the problem. We can say, oh, man, I do that every once in a while. Every one of us can probably say, oh, man, I've never been like that. Oh, man, I am not getting there. Oh, man, that fits me. No, no, no. But where is your senses at? Have you come to your senses? Or do you understand you were in opposition and now Christ has set you free? And now you can go out in the power of God and live this out. And you don't have to stay here, but you're being transformed by the renewing of the mind because you keep changing your mind. When you meet the will of God. Do you have self-control? Are you asking the Holy Spirit to control you and teach you? Brutal or fierce, King James, savage. This is the only usage here. Savage. Despisers of good. Now really, King James says this. Despisers of those that are good. Listen, not just despisers of good, despisers of those that are good. Oh, you goody two huge Christians. You guys got everything right. Yeah. They despise it. They're opposed to goodness. They're hostile to virtue. They make good bad and bad good. They're opposed to good. They despise those that are good. And they make doing wrong the cool thing and the good thing and the right thing and doing good the bad thing. We know that there, we're in the last days when we see this. Traitors, they betray. Uh, I think I'm going to another company. I'm selling out for the most dollar. Nobody is loyal anymore. They don't surrender. But traitors surrender in the sense of giving forth into another the enemy's hand. used one other time in scripture Acts 19.36 we getting tired 19.36 of Acts I tell you what it was if I remember what the reference was and it would be quicker 19.36 is the goddess Diana therefore since these things cannot be denied you ought to be quiet and do nothing rashly is that right? That was for headstrong, the next one. Sorry, that was good. This word traitors was used first when they referenced Judas in Luke 6.16. Judas, who was a traitor, that's his epitaph. Uh, headstrong is heady, falling forward. Listen to this, rash, and it's used first, rash. Don't do nothing rash. They're in Acts. Um, listen, it means, headstrong means reckless. The church sings a song about God's reckless love. And it's in the category of the last perilous days that it's a reckless person that is an apostate, that doesn't know God, that's in opposition to God. And we sing a song about reckless love. God's love is not reckless. I don't care how poetic and how you spin it, how you twist it, how you do it. God's love is, is there purposely, always in control, always precise, always on time. Everything about it, nothing is reckless involved in it. However, an apostate's character, when they're headstrong and falling forward, they become reckless. God's not falling forward. God's got it all planned out. He spoke it into existence. He knows the end but from the beginning. You cannot be reckless when you know everything. It's impossible. Haughty, which is high-minded, means to envelop with smoke or to inflate with self-conceit, be lifted up with pride. Lovers of pleasure... rather than lovers of God. 
Notice this. This is where the church is moving towards pleasure, self, entertainment. What am I doing this weekend? What am I doing today? How am I going to take care of self? Caught up in this entertainment culture, caught up in the pleasure of life and self, uh, um, they become fond of pleasure. Uh, they're, they're friendly or an associate with pleasure, and it's all about self. This is the only place this word for pleasure is used. And we see it in our culture. We build entertainment centers. We build uh, amusement parks. We build everything for the pleasure of self. Down here on this battleground, this graveyard, and we're treating it like a playground where we get to have pleasure and stay focused on self rather than God. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. This is what we're talking about in the church. Verse 5, having a form of godliness, form, morphous, having is echo, which means possessing, that's the condition Echomorphosis, formation, it's an appearance of godliness. Godliness means holiness and respect and reverence to the gospel scheme of things. Got some good manners, I got a good job, and I can I can go to church and have some religion, but it's a form of godliness. But there's the big but. But denying to contradict to reject to refuse its power its force its miraculous power its wonderful work of the cross they refuse to believe and they deny the very thing that the power is for that the cross to set us free from the penalty of sin so that we can learn to change our mind, that we can be changed, that we can be, um, what was that word? Persuaded. Not be unpersuadable, but we can be persuaded to follow God, to be conformed into the image of God, to do the will of God. We really need to ask ourselves, are we surrendering to God? Are we looking to surrender to God? Are we crying out to God? Are we in the word, prayer, and fellowship uh, trying to grow in the grace and the knowledge of God? Or do we just hold and possess a condition that's form of godliness and deny the power and contradict it by the life that we live or living? Excuse me. And he says real clearly, and from such people, such, these is what it really means, uh, turn away. Guess where that's used first at? Matthew 7, 24. Be away from me. I never knew you. That's where this is used first at. Because listen, what's the important thing? is that you disassociate and you don't fellowship with people that are living in an ungodly way so that they will know there's something wrong. There's something wrong with my relationship with the other parts of the church because of how I'm living. It's not to accuse them. It's not to destroy them. It's to get them to change their mind so they won't be in opposition with the gospel scheme of things. We want people to be redeemed but if we put up with and walk with them and do what they're doing, we're allowing them to be deceived and being deceived with them. Everybody else is doing it. Might as well do it. No, we're supposed to be witnesses individually and corporately together, not just allowing it to happen. And sometimes you have to have a disfellowship. You have to have a separation so that people will know there's a problem. And standing to doctrine and standing on the truth of the word of God will separate you. 
such people turn away and avoid. Now listen, I, again, we've already talked about this earlier. God clearly gives us a mandate to go to the world. But he doesn't want us to become apostates with apostates. He doesn't want us to become like the people that don't listen to the Holy Spirit by hanging out with a bunch of people that are ignoring the Holy Spirit and the power thereof. And then he goes on to say this, and, 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 and I'm going to go out on a limb and we'll finish this. It's verse 6, number of man. For of this sort... are those who creep, sneak in, wrap up, hide, sink low, they put on cloth, sheep or wolves in sheep's clothing, into households, common house, and make captives, POWs, prisoners of war, comes from a word for prisoners of war, of gullible women, silly women, King James says, it's a normal word for little women, foolish women, loaded down with sins. Loaded down is laden in the King James. Listen to what this means, laden. It means to pile up or to heap up, but really, it's from a word soros. I thought it was funny because of George Soros. It's soros, but the word soros is an urn for keeping bones of the dead for a funeral. It's a coffin. It's what we would call a coffin. In fact, it, it, it's the funeral couch or the bier on which the Jews carried their dead to be buried. So see, if we're loaded down and we're not listening and we're the, letting creeps creep in, then we are making our own deathbed. We're at our own coffin. With sins, offenses, errors, violations of divine law, led away, driven away, induced by various lusts, divers lust, manifold lust. It's uh, uh, the desire is uh, a longing, especially for that which is forbidden. Always learning at all times. I mean, oh, I've been going to church. I've been listening to sermons. I've been watching them on TV. I've been doing all these things, but never able to come to the knowledge, full understanding of the truth. Why? Because they have no spirit. They have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. And they're not doing it with a heart to obey God. They're doing it with just a religious pretense and being led away, taken captive. Now, I believe, listen, that this is not speaking. I mean, there's a lot of women in those days that needed, because you become like a, 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 a homeless person really quick if you didn't have a husband to take care of you in that day. So there's all these women that are that, that, and, and orphans. And that's why he says pure and unadulterated religion is to take care of widows and orphans in their need, the people of need, right? But I believe the analogy is, is us as the woman, the church. We're the woman. That's not dealing with sin, not coming to our senses. We're allowing creeps to come in and speak to our flesh and say the things that fit into what we want to believe and we can keep doing what we're doing instead of becoming lovers of God, we're lovers of pleasure and we're the ones that need to wake up and not let creeps creep in and deceive us with lies and think that we're okay when we're building on sand. We need to come to the truth. See, it's never able. And it, it, it's the word dynama, which they don't have the power. It's not possible to come to the knowledge of the truth, to grow, because there's no spirit. And I believe and we're in dire need today of the church hearing what the spirit has to say to the church. Not what men, not what books, not what preachers, but what the spirit of God would say to the church today. He says, Behold, I'm standing at the door and knocking. And, and, and anyone who hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and dine with him and he with me. There's a fellowship being offered to those who think they're okay when they're not because they're denying the power thereof. That's the age that we live in because we have need of nothing. I'm okay as long as I got my next sandwich in the refrigerator. I'm okay as long as I got my next $2 for gas. 
But if you mess with that, you're messing with me. And anybody who messes with my family, I'm going to mess with you. You know, we begin all these crazy things instead of surrendering and praying for our enemies and looking for opportunity to be led by the Spirit to witness the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And then he goes on to say, that was verse 7, by the way. Uh-oh. No power, not able. Verse 8, new beginning. What? We're back to the subject of these demons. As was I Iannis and Ambrys, or commonly called Janus and Jambres, Janus uh, means he vexed. These were the magis that stood, according to uh, uh, Jewish books that are not biblical, I have to say, uh, but they handed down for generations that Janus and Jambres were the two magi, the magicians, that stood before Pharaoh when Moses and Aaron were there, and Aaron would perform the signs as the prophet, and, and, and Moses would say, let my people go, and these guys mimicked it until, what is it, Exodus, I wrote it down, Exodus 8.18, they said, oh, Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. But it was already too late, because Pharaoh had already hardened his heart. And even when they began to testify, oh my goodness, this is the finger of God, we can't do this. Pharaoh still would not turn. So just as these, uh, jam Jambres means foamy healer, foamy healer, which is talked about with Jude, the apostates, the apostates in Jude 12 and 13, listen to this. These are spots in your love feast. These demons, they're in your love feast. They have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof. They're actually not trying to live for God. They're selfish. They're unholy, unloving. All they're doing is having a form while they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves. They are clouds without water. Now they got, I mean, it looks like clouds, but there's no Holy Spirit. Carried about by the winds every wind of doctrine, late autumn trees without fruit, so there's no fruit of the Holy Spirit, twice dead, pulled up by the roots. What happens? Throws them into the fire. When he pulls them up by the roots, cast into the fire, raging waves of the sea. Here it is, foaming up their own shame. That's what Jan or Jambres means, foamy healer. Foamy, like foam in the water when the water's crashing. Make a little bit of foam. Wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness and darkness forever. Of course, stars I always allude to as the fallen stars. A third of the angels fell. They're called stars. And we have Hollywood stars. And everybody wants to follow them instead of follow God. We want to follow everything in the culture instead of be a lovers of God. And he says, just as Janus and Jambres... resisted Moses, withstood Moses, they stand it against, they opposed him, they set themselves against him, against, uh, he says, just as they did, so do these also resist the truth. Truth is a person, Jesus Christ. Men of corrupt minds, uh, depraved minds, this is the word uh, cataphirio, where we get uh, 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 cauterize or cauterization. So their minds, their, their hearts have been cauterized where they're so hard they can't receive anything. The flow of blood will not flow. Uh, corrupt minds, disapproved, reprobate is the King James, castaways, like you do with that little stemmy thing that grapes hang on. Cast it away. It's good for nothing. Sorry. They're disapproved concerning with respect to the faith. Now this is the word pistis, not pistio. And pistis is after you make a covenant, after you believe, then you have pistis, which is a constancy in your faith. You continue to walk it out. You continue to turn back. 
Because many people say they believe, but they don't rely upon God for salvation. They're not led by His Spirit. They're not walking in His truth. They, they said, I come to my senses, but they didn't go back toward home where they could get the signet ring and the clothing on. And all they've done is said, I come to my senses, but they stayed in the pig pens. They stayed in the field. They didn't go home. They're still without home. They haven't settled that in their heart that they have a home. And it says that they will progress or proceed no further for their folly will be manifest to all as Janice and Jamboree's as theirs was also. And of course, like I said in Exodus 18, they said, Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. So their folly, when they couldn't keep repeating, they couldn't keep going. And listen to me, if you try to live the gospel and walk it out and bear fruit and you try to do it in the flesh, you'll wear out. You'll walk away. You'll burn out. You will not stay in the... If you don't stay in the Word, Prayer, and Fellowship where you get your energy from, confessing your sin and listening to the Holy Spirit, you're never going to want to be a lover of God. You're always going to be only concerned with your own flesh and what, what's in it for me. Drives me crazy. Oh, I'm sorry. i got to stop that. My, your mom used to get so mad at me when I'd say that. But people that all they're doing, even after you preach a sermon and you think, man, I knocked it out of the ballpark, they stand up and go, what about me? And, and, and they don't say it in those words. But you're going, oh, did we not hear nothing? What is the Spirit saying to the church? And I know I can do the same thing. I can step in the same mud hole. And, and, and God will convict me and, and, and I have to repent. But we need to wake up to what God is saying to the church. Because it's mere folly. It, uh, the word means stupidity. Um, and then he goes on, and let's finish this, and I'll read this out. But you have carefully followed. He's talking to Timothy. He's talking to his son. He says, you've carefully followed. Are you carefully following what we need to be following? Uh, uh, my doctrine. First thing. Doctrine. That's teaching how to live. Manner of life. They've seen him walking it out. Purpose. What was he purposing in? What was he doing? His faith of how he went through things. My long suffering, there was pain. Love, perseverance, persecution, afflictions. These are things that follow true faith. And he's saying, Timothy, you've carefully followed it. You've seen my testimony, which happened to me in Antioch, in Iconium, at Lystra. Again, that means ransoming. It's Timothy's hometown. It's where the two met. What persecutions I endured. Oh, you have to endure persecutions. And out of them all the Lord delivered me. Soteria, that's the word for salvation. Yes, and all who desire, uh, you, you crave, you lust after, you desire to live godly in Christ Jesus. There's no other way to live godly. It has to be in Christ Jesus. Will not made my good will suffer persecution. Listen, if there's no persecutions, maybe you're apostate. If there's no persecution, maybe you don't desire to live godly in Christ. That's all I'm just saying what the word says there. But evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Listen, they're in the church growing worse and worse. Look at the church. Look at the people leaving all the old movements. They're going, we can't stay there. I talk to people every day that don't know where to go to church because all the old movements and all the old churches and everybody are adopting all the lies and not teaching the word of God. They grow worse and worse. They're not just deceived, but they're deceiving and being deceived by these false demons, the spirit of Antichrist. And the, the, the devil is trying to deceive the elect if it were possible. Jesus, it's all going to happen. It's all going to be torn down, all the things. And what did he say? They said, when's it all going to happen, Jesus? And that's what we do. We sit around and go, when? When? You said when? 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 No, he says, you. This is the utmost importance. That you're carefully following the doctrine, manner of life, purposes, faith. Listen. Do not be deceived. Planeo, cause to be seduced or roam from safety or virtue or truth. Do not be deceived. That's what we should be looking for because deceivers 
are growing worse and worse. And we need to be careful. But you must continue, abide, remain, stand in the things which you have learned and been assured of knowing from whom you have learned them and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures. Well, why would you need to know the Holy Scriptures? Can't you just get rid of the Old Testament? Listen, think about it. Andy Stanley, let's just jettison this book. It's a Jewish book. Let's get rid of it. Wait a minute. There was no New Testament when he was writing this. It became the New Testament. And Timothy, he knew the Old Testament from childhood, which was able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus, we now know the mystery. Before, it was just looking forward, it would, we, but we didn't know it was Jesus Christ. He knows it now. He knew it then when Paul was introducing it to Timothy. But the Old Testament saints and the Holy Scriptures didn't know it. They were just knowing that God was going to provide provision. And they believed God, and it was accounted to them for righteousness. Listen, it's so important that we understand that we can believe God. And if we don't believe God, then we're not righteous. If we don't believe God. And that's disbelieving or unbelieving. But they clearly knew it then. And then now we won't even read the scriptures. I deal with people every day and I go, you must read the scriptures. Well, I'm saved. Well, how do you know you're saved? You don't know nothing about the scriptures. How do you know you're not being deceived? And then going out and deceiving others because you think you're okay. We must come to know our husbandmen and become wise for salvation through faith that's in Christ. And then he tells us this, which is the cure. Here is the balm of Gilead. All scripture is given. It's a free gift, just like Christ, because he is the living word of God by inspiration of God. It means in the Greek, God breathed. He breathed it out as he spoke and created Bera ex nihilo out of nothing, the heavens and the earth, for six days, and then he rested. And is profitable for doctrine, once again, teaching us how to live, for reproof, which is reproving, and telling you, nope, that's not the way to do it. Reproof. Whoa, you're still washing and cleansing. But it doesn't just leave you there with saying no. It's for correction, which is one of my favorite words in the whole of the Bible. Correction, which means standing back up again, that which has been knocked down. See, we were knocked down by sin, and he stood us back up in our rightful place. In the ancient world, that's how that word was used. If something got knocked over, they would say correct that, and it meant put it right back where we put it at. In God's decoration, in his cosmos, in his orderly arrangement, he put us right back by the blood of Jesus where we were before, and it allows us and causes us to stand. That's amazing to me. So he didn't just spank our butt, but he corrects us, tells us how to live. And then he gives us more instruction, training in sanctification, training in righteousness. Why, Greg, that the man of God and the woman of God, the child of God, may be complete, mature, finished, thoroughly equipped for every good work, which has the connotation that we're called to do works. Ephesians 2.10, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus Four good works that we should walk in them. Peripateo. Peripateo. Walk in them. Your general walk should be do the, to do the will of God. Behold, it is written in the volume of the book, I have come to do thy will, O God. Listen, don't get caught up in, in disputes and wrangling. The bond person of the Lord is not quarrelsome. We are called to go and make disciples. We're called to be ambassadors to win souls. Next week, Luke 19.32. Luke 19.32. Don't get confused. Luke 19.32. Because we're called to go. Luke 19.32. So those who were sent went their way and found it just as he had said to them. 
I love that verse. Luke 19.32. Listen to me. So those who were sent went their way and found it just as he had said to them. Write it down. Commit it to memory. Think about it. Look at the context. This is going to get the donkey. But we're going to talk about much, much more in that context. Because we've been sent. And we should know that God's went before us. He's prepared everything before us. And we will find it just like he told the church. Just like he always tells us what's going to happen. We will find what's going on in the scriptures. He's not leaving us blind. He wants us to trust him and to follow him and to obey him and to be transformed by the renewing of the mind so we may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for calling us out of darkness into your marvelous light. Now, Lord, give us the desire uh, to proclaim your praises, to speak loudly in the marketplace your salvation and to avoid useless disputes and arguments, but to bring it back to you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. The Lord bless you.